Hi, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to church. We're kind of recording our announcements at a different location. Uh, we're up at Lake Louise. Laurel and I and Josh and Joanna have had a chance to be at our pastor's prayer retreat for this last week. Thank you for sending us. Uh, it's just been wonderful to be able to be out here uh, to enjoy uh, the company of fellow pastors and enjoy just the grace of God. Some announcements that we want to bring to your attention this morning. Uh, first of all, is Christmas Eve service. We're really excited about Christmas Eve service. It's going to be from 6.30 to 7.30 on Christmas Eve. Uh, we would love it if you would bring your friends and family and just incorporate our service into your Christmas Eve celebrations. We won't have church uh, the next day on Christmas Day. Uh, spend it with your family. Enjoy the company of your family. But then we're going to meet again on New Year's Day and have a regular church service on New Year's Day. But I'm wondering, uh, do you have something that you would like to share of how God has worked in your life, you've seen God at work, or you've just felt the presence of God this past year? Uh, we'd love to have a time of sharing scripture, uh, of sharing uh, what we've seen God at work in our lives, and then we'll uh, spend some time in prayer and committing our, the year ahead to God. Well, God bless you this morning. We're going to go to our Advent reading and then prayer and, uh, and then our connection time together. Well, thank you, Jenna. She's off to Sunday school for reading our scripture this morning. Well, we are wrapping up our sermon series on the promise. Uh, and we've seen God's promise uh, on several different ways and through several different people. Uh, God's promise of hope and God's promise of peace and God's promise of joy. And then this morning, God's promise of love. And we've celebrated these promises through the word Advent. And Advent means arrival. Advent happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus arrived in this world. But Advent is going to happen again when Jesus arrives again. And so we sit in these promises of Jesus where we saw them fulfilled, we, we see them fulfilled, we read about them in the Bible, and we also wait for them to be fully fulfilled uh, in this world. You know, we use the phrase, the Christmas spirit. Uh, and this is really what Christmas is all about, that we celebrate Jesus and we anticipate Jesus because we worship a God who is a God of promises. Um, well, let's pray before we go to God's word. So would you stand and let's just commit ourselves to God this morning. God, I thank you that you are a God of promises, that you are a God of promises that are fulfilled and that will be fulfilled. And God, we sit in that and we wait on you. And that's a good place to be uh, because you are a faithful God. So this morning, God, would you uh, open our minds and our hearts to hear from you uh, we set aside our preconceived ideas. We set aside uh, the, the things of this world that would take our attention off of you. And for just these moments, uh, we look to you. Uh, would you speak to us? And would we have the perception to hear what it is that you have to say? We commit ourselves to you. In your name, amen. You can have a seat. Well, Christmas is all about love, isn't it? You know, sometimes we think that Valentine's Day is all about love, but there is no better expression of love than at Christmas time. You know, Valentine's Day is all, is all about the expression of our love, but Christmas is all about the expression of God's love to us. So there's a certain adult in our household that loves watching Hallmark Christmas movies. Now, I won't tell you who it is, but it's not me. Um, you know, when I was a kid, there were very few TV Christmas movies that you could watch. And you're in the same boat that I'm in. Uh, they were the same ones every year. And they only came on occasionally, right? Maybe, and maybe they added one new one a year. But now, there are so many TV Christmas movies that there is a new one that comes out every single day. So there is the company Hallmark, and Hallmark cranks out over 40 of these feel-good Christmas movies every year. They have their own channel that they show these things on. It is a marathon. You can watch the Hallmark channel nonstop from November all the way until January. But, so I don't watch them 
somebody else in our household loves watching them, but it's not me. And I, because I can sit down and I can predict what's going to happen in every single movie that they come out with. You can too. You know, the storyline always revolves around this generically attractive couple. And they will fall in love with each other by the end, you know, in the midst of their initial reservations for each other. Or they knew each other from childhood. And they will mend that relationship before the movie is done. And it'll always involve one of them moving back to town, isn't it? And they will team up against this uh, Scrooge-like person, this land developer, who's going to try and mess up this rural little hamlet that they, that they live in, right? And they will all wear luxurious Christmas sweaters. You know, they will all have cozy living rooms that are meticulously decorated. You know, there will be piles and piles of artificial snow outside. The cold doesn't seem to bother them in their decorative Christmas sweaters, but it's cold enough for the snow. And there will always be puppies, right? And these characters and these storylines and these locations, you know, it's always the same. It's this rustic little charming small town, right? You know, there's the female lead who is unhappy with her job from the big city. And then there is the generically handsome male character that's somewhat combative and yet genuinely loving. And there will always be that last minute change of heart that happens, right? And there will always be, you know, the, the love of Christmas that emerges at the end. You know, you can almost predict it and you can kind of mock them all that you want, but they're insanely popular. They are, you know, not to pick on Hallmark, but they're kind of just the front runners of all of this. Hallmark releases 40 new Christmas movies every year. 40. More than 80 million people regularly watch their channel. You know, in, December, in November and December, which is when they're showing their movies, uh, Hallmark Channel is the number one network the number one most popular, most watched network, and it generates over $350 million in advertising uh, for this company. You know, why do feel-good movies have such a grip on us? Why are they so popular? Why do we love to escape to this world where the storyline is just so predictable, it's almost humorous? You know, what is it that draws in such a huge audience year after year. Well, I think it's because that they tap into something that we are all longing for. They tap into a love that is redemptive. They tap into a love that is stronger than us, stronger than people's situations, stronger than their history. It's a love that brings people back together. And it's a love that mends relationships. It's a love that gives hope again. Because we all long for a love that is stronger than the pain of this world. You know, we have this ideal about Christmas, that Christmas should be all about love. You know, Hallmark just makes movies about it. They bring these emotions to light. But Christmas is all about love. We want Christmas to be all about love. This world talks a lot about love, doesn't it? You know, we sing songs about love. Uh, we make movies about love. We've created an entire holiday about love, Valentine's Day, where we spend billions and billions of dollars on flowers and chocolates and dinners and ways that we express our love to another person. We are obsessed with love. But we get it wrong in our world. We don't have a good handle on love. We don't have a good lock on love. You know, we say that the high mark of love is loving others. And that's true. Uh, we're supposed to love each other, and we're supposed to love each other as Jesus commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves. But our love is just kind of a form of that love. Our love is just simply we're supposed to accept people. We're not supposed to judge people. You know, we say that love is loving ourselves, and we are supposed to be kind to ourselves, and we are supposed to learn to, you know, accept the way that we are. And I'm not saying that it's wrong, but sometimes we can be our own worst enemies. You know, the Bible says that we're supposed to find our identity and love of ourselves in the fact that we're loved and created by God. You know, we don't, in our world today, we don't have a handle on love. We get it wrong. And the proof is that this world is not a very loving place. 
You know, the proof is that even though we have lots of instructions of how we're supposed to love each other and how we're supposed to love ourselves, the proof is that this world is pretty void of actual love. Our love turns selfish so quickly. Our love turns self-serving so quickly. You know, it becomes all about me. And you become secondary. This love of the world, it just falls flat. But that's the world's love. That's their definition of love. God's love is different. God's love doesn't fit the world. Never has. It never will. Bible says that God is love. The love that he gives is a reflection of who he, who he is. The Bible says that God's love isn't just an emotion, that it's transcendent love. It's higher than anything that we can conceptualize. The Bible says that God's love is not of this world. It's foreign to our natural instinct. And the Bible says that God's love is found in the person of Jesus that this transcendent love of God, this very essence of God himself, this love that is beyond our natural ability to understand, became visible and became real to us in the person of Jesus. And the beautiful thing about the love of God is that it saves us. It doesn't just make us feel better about ourselves. It saves us from ourselves. The world says that to love is to celebrate ourselves, in all of our strengths and weaknesses and inadequacies and all of that, and that only leads to destruction. God's love redeems things. God's love makes everything that's going wrong, it makes it go right. It calls us to live differently. This is the love of God. And so this morning, we're looking at the story of Mary. Mary was the person who conceived the love of God. She carried the love of God in her womb. And Mary brought this person of Jesus, this manifest expression of God's love into the world. Well, the Bible begins its story about Mary by talking about an angel that visits her. And it says, the angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. The Bible says that Mary had found favor with God. Well, what does it mean to be favored by God? I have a favorite snack. You know, I have a favorite movie. I have a favorite sweatshirt that I like to wear. I have a favorite sports team that I like to follow. I have a favorite season of the year. But that is not the same as having God's favor. The angel says that Mary was highly favored by God that Mary was uniquely special to God. And I think it's because Mary was willing to receive the calling that God was placing on her life. Mary was prepared. Her life was available. She was available to be interrupted by God. And so the angel visits Mary, and honestly, the, the angel's message to Mary creates anxiety within her. It says that she was troubled, that she didn't understand what the angel meant. So Mary was a very devout Jewish woman, and she likely knew the weight of this word favored. You know, and she probably wondered how this favor could have fallen on her, how she fit into this category, because the people that deserved the title of being favored were the kings of Israel, and they were the priests, and they were the prophets. They were the faithful ones of Israel, the heroes of the faith. These are the people that are favored by God, Moses, and Noah, and Joseph, and Samuel. Bible says that they are the ones that received the favor of God. So what does it mean to have God's favor on a person? Well, when you look at the people of the Bible that were favored by God, it wasn't because of their social position. It wasn't because of their wealth. It wasn't because of their power. It wasn't because of their authority or their military strengths or their intelligence or even their leadership qualities. God continually extends his favor to people who are available and open to God's plans. People filled with humility. People filled with grace. People who are able to be interrupted by God. These are the people that God is looking for. Why is that? 
Well, because God has a divine plan for this world. God is actively working to bring about his kingdom into this world, this redeemed kingdom, this kingdom where everything that is wrong is made right. And God is looking for people who are willing to be used by him. He loves working out his plan in us. And on the most important intersection of his plan, Mary fit into it perfectly. You know, I don't think that Mary possessed any qualities that you and I don't possess. What she and so many of the heroes of their faith possessed is simply the ability to be used by God. She was humble. She was willing. She was interruptible. But Mary's favor leads to Mary's fear. You know, fear isn't usually an emotion that's associated with Christmas, is it? You know, we usually don't have cards that have the word fear on the top of it. Uh, Joy and peace and hope and love, you know, those are the themes of Christmas, but fear? But yet, all throughout the Christmas story, you see fear at work. You see the fear of the shepherds when the angel visits them. You see the fear of Herod, that someone has been born a king who is a challenge to him. You see the fear of Joseph, that Mary is pregnant and it's not his child. And you see the fear of Mary. You know, just here's a picture. Let me paint a picture of Mary, of what Mary is stepping into. So at Jewish culture at that time, Mary and Joseph, it says, were betrothed. They were legally bound to each other. They didn't live together. They weren't intimate with each other. But other than that, they were married. You know, in our culture, an engagement is not legally binding. You can break off an engagement, and it's awkward, but there's no legal battle that you have to go through. But not at that time. They were legally betrothed to each other. Mary was also very young. 13 to 16 years of age. That's the betrothal age. And Mary was also from this little town called Nazareth, this dirty, nothing-to-do town. In fact, it was often this despised town. People would say, Jesus from Nazareth? What does Nazareth have to offer? And so the angel comes to this young girl in the middle of nowhere and says this to her. Do not be afraid. You, Mary, have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. Mary, even though you are not married and you are still a virgin, you're going to give birth to the Savior of the world. This Jewish Messiah that your people have been waiting for, for hundreds of years, you will do this very thing. And it's going to interrupt your life, and it's going to mess with your plans, and it's going to wreck your peace, and it's going to disrupt your sleep and your friendships, and every inch of your world is going to change. But you, Mary, are favored by God. So don't be afraid. And his name is going to be Jesus and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. An author, Jerusha Matson, writes this. He says, I know why Mary is afraid. It's not that the angel isn't coming, it's that he's already there. He's already there, right in this quiet space, and he's waiting for an answer. You know, you have to understand Mary's fear. Because her life has now become an instant source of gossip and ridicule. You know, her saying yes to God will be met with ridicule and scorn and shame and maybe even the threat of death. Because a woman who gets pregnant before her wedding is assumed to be an adulteress. And if she maintained her innocence, she would be taken to a public place, maybe the gate of the city, and her clothing would be torn, and her hair would be let down, which is how the prostitutes at the time wore their hair. And she would be left there, and she would be mocked, and she would be humiliated. And if the evidence became convincing enough, i.e. a baby growing inside of her, she could be stoned to death. 
You know, think of even Joseph. Joseph could have abandoned the ship. He could have left Mary poor and unwed and with a child. What are the odds that her devout Jewish husband would stick with her? You know, what are the odds that her community would accept her, much less forgive her? What are the odds that she would get any semblance of life after all this? Because you have to see, the angel doesn't say to her, Mary, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. He just says to her, don't be afraid. You know, but I think that Mary knew something about God. I think that she knew something about God's ability that allowed her to hold on to her faith in the midst of all of this impending darkness. You know, Mary would have known the times that God interrupted people's lives. You know, she would have known about Moses encountering God at a burning bush. You know, at a time when the Israelites were suffering and they were dying in Egypt, God interrupted Moses. She would have known about Samuel and God speaking to Samuel in the dark. You know, when the priesthood and the temple were totally corrupt, when they were extorting the people, manipulating the people, she knew about Samuel and how God interrupted Samuel. She would have known about Gideon and God meeting him in this abandoned threshing floor when the Israelites were being mercilessly persecuted and oppressed by the Midianites. This is the God she worshipped. God interrupts people's lives. When God has something really important to do, when God is about to bring about redemption to his people, when God is about to step in and make things right, God interrupts people's lives. God loves to interrupt our lives. And God's favor rests with lives that are interruptible. Because God has this incredible chess move that he's about to play. He's sending his very son, Jesus, God himself, the embodiment of God's love. He's sending Jesus into the world to redeem the world, to bring about this concept of love that we desperately need, this concept of love that isn't compatible with the world. Phil Yancey says this, often a work of God comes with two edges, great joy and great pain. And Mary embraces both. She was the first person to accept Jesus on his own terms, regardless of the personal cost. God is interrupting Mary's life because God is about to do something that is going to interrupt the entire world. You know, years later, the disciple John is going to write about what this divine interruption in Mary's life would bring. This is the disciple that walked along with Jesus. This is the disciple that watched his arrest, that watched his execution. This is the disciple that ran to the tomb to see that it was empty. John understood what it meant to have your life interrupted by Jesus. And he wrote this. Jenna read it. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. There is nothing that has been more of a disruption into this world than the love of God. Nothing has reset the history of this world than the love of God arriving. God reset the axis of world history with the birth of Jesus. The greatest interruption, it was needed. The world's love, the world's definition of love needed to be replaced with God's love. 
The world's definition and the world's practice of love has always been false. It has always been flawed. It's always been destructive. God's love was needed. And it arrived in the person of Jesus. And John says that there are three things that God's love interrupted in this world. John says that God is the initiator of love. He's the initiator of love. He writes that we have the capacity to love because God loved us first. God knew that we couldn't love him on our own. Our love is self-oriented. It's self-centered. We cannot love God. So God made the first move. And because God made the first move, we now can love him in return. John says that the proof of God living in us is found in our love overflowing out of us. You know, John goes even so far to say that if we do not love, something's wrong. If we do not have God's love flowing out of us, we actually don't know God. You can't claim to know God and not have God's love flow out of you. You know, we're always looking for evidence of God's spirit living in us. We're always looking for evidence. You know, do I, what, what do I see of God's spirit living in us? Well, here's a key one. Do we have the capacity to love as God loves? You know, that's a gut check, isn't it? I know so often in my life, I don't love as God loves. I don't love people as God loves people. My love is still selfish. But this is God's interruption in my life. This is God's interruption into the way that I interact with the world. Will I love others with the way that God has loved me? And the third thing that John says, the interruption of God's love, is that God's love is a testimony to the world. This is what the world is looking for, and God's love in us is a testimony to the world. God's love isn't just evidence in our own lives, but it's evidence in the world around us. God's plan is to show up in the world. God's plan is to reveal himself to the world. God's plan is that every person has the opportunity to encounter God. And his plan to show up in the world is found in us. You know, this world is desperate for love. This world is desperate for the hallmark moments you know, that love that is greater than themselves. And God shows up in people's lives because of our love for them. The evidence that the world is looking for is seen in God's love at work in our lives. No pressure, but the world is looking at you to see God. But don't be intimidated because it's not a love that you need to manufacture. It's a love that is readily available. It's a love that fills all the corners of our lives. It's a love that changes us. It's a love that redeems us. It's a love that makes everything wrong in life right. But here's the key. You have to have a life that's interruptible by God. You have to have a heart that's open to God. You have to have a life that allows God to step into it that's open to his leading, that's open to new opportunities, that's open to those experiences that stretch us and that allow God's spirit to move. Well, let me close our time. So in our culture today, there is this new phenomenon among young couples when they find themselves pregnant, and it's called a gender reveal. You've seen it. You've seen the YouTube videos of it where they will plan this elaborate party and then they will reveal to everyone whether it's a boy or a girl. And I read the other day that some gender reveals cost up to $10,000. And so couples have pink or blue cakes baked that give away their secret when you cut into them. Or they fill balloons with pink and blue powder and they shoot guns at them. Or they load pink and blue, I saw this, they load pink or blue powder in the exhaust of their pickup truck and they fire it up and blue smoke goes up in the air and everyone celebrates. They release boxes full of pink or blue balloons. You name it. Somebody has probably done it. So back in our age, Laurel and I, we didn't do a gender reveal party. It wasn't trendy back then. And honestly, I don't think we would have done it anyway. 
But when all three of our kids arrived in this world, we were ready for them. We were ready for them. In fact, we became more and more ready for each new child when they came along the way. We were ready enough for Aiden. But by the time Hannah arrived, Laurel even knew what she wanted to eat the night before the delivery. We were ready. You know, Mary and Joseph were ready for the birth of Jesus. They were prepared for the birth of Jesus. You know, oftentimes we think that they were unprepared. You know, because they hadn't arranged for a room to stay in Bethlehem, right? You know, they had to go and give birth in a stable. They didn't have anything to wrap Jesus in. You know, they weren't ready for all of the unexpected visitors, but the truth is they were ready for Jesus. They were, because God had already done a work in their hearts. God had already done a work in their hearts. In order to receive a promise from God, in order to receive something new that God has, we need to prepare for it. We need to be ready for it. And so as we close this morning, is your heart ready? Is your heart ready? prepared to receive Jesus. You know, sometimes we think that it's a once and done preparation. I received Jesus many years ago. I don't need to do anything new. And you're right. You don't need to receive salvation again. But do you think that God is done in your life? Do you think that God is finished in your life? Do you think that God has nothing more to do for you? Is there nothing more that you want to receive from him? You know, why did Simeon understand that he was holding the Messiah in his arms when everyone around him missed it? Why did he catch it? Well, because he was prepared. Why did the shepherds, you know, turn from shock and fear to wonder and curiosity to returning to their fields rejoicing at the announcement of Jesus? Because their hearts were prepared. Why did Zechariah and Elizabeth welcome the birth of John who would prepare the way of Jesus? Their hearts were ready to receive it. You will never understand the depth of God's love until you allow it to transform you. You will never be able to understand all that God wants to redeem in your life until you prepare your heart to receive that from him. And you'll never be able to give that love to others. The love that they truly need unless it's happened in your life first. This is how we live in Advent. This is how we live in the spirit of Christmas, if you want to call it that. Not only the arrival of Jesus long ago, but the anticipation of what Jesus is going to do, that he's coming again. God longs to do something new in our lives. He longs to continually interrupt our lives, to continually set us on the path that leads to him. He loves doing that. But but we but we, but we have to have our lives open to be interrupted by God. We cannot conjure the love of God. We can simply receive it. But we have to prepare our hearts to receive it. God wants us to be receivers of his love. God wants us to walk in his love. God wants us to be dispensers of his love. Do you want that? Do you want that in your life? Let's pray. God, in the solitariness of the moment, where it is just you and us, we say to you, we want our hearts to receive you. We want our hearts to be ready, to be prepared for you. Because you are a God who loves to show up. You are constantly showing up. God, we want to be like Mary, where we have found favor with you. Because we want you to show up in our life too. Not simply for us, but for the world around us. And so this morning, God, we prepare ourselves for you. We ready our hearts. We open them up to receive from you. Because we want you to come in. We want to receive you. 
So God, in the quietness of this morning, would you simply hear our prayer to you? That personal prayer that is just from me to you. Jesus, would you come? Would you come into my heart? Would you come into my life? No matter how many times you've already been here, come again. We want to receive from you. Amen.